So the key to understanding the location and the appearance of extracranial versus intracranial collections, namely hemorrhaging in the case of traumatic brain injury, is to gain an understanding of the meningeal anatomy as well as the layers of which blood can accumulate. So specifically, the learning objectives associated with this Lightboard video is to be able to understand and describe the anatomy corresponding to the layers of the scalp as well as the cerebral meningeal layers. I personally find that the best way to solidify your understanding and knowledge of these concepts is to be able to draw out the layers from superficial to deep systematically. So firstly, if we remember the anatomical composition of the skull, we know that it contains three layers. So firstly, we have an outer and inner cortical table, and then this is going to be separated by spongy or trabecular bone known as dipoli. Other or alternative terminology for these tables can be the periosteal or endosteal layers. In this specific drawing, all of the layers that are going to be more superficial, so to the bottom of this drawing, are going to be towards the skin. So this is going to be all of our extracranial structures because they're going to be exterior to the cranium. And then consistently, all of the structures that are going to be within the cranial cavity, deep to the skull, are going to be intracranial. This is important because when we're talking about intra versus extracranial hemorrhages or collections, an extracranial hemorrhage is going to be located exterior to the skull, but it's going to be deep to the skin and then an intracranial lesion or collection is going to be internal so within the skull cavity um, and it's going to be either associated with the brain or external to the brain in the form of the meningeal layers. So a nice mnemonic that we can use to remember the order of layers from superficial so being skin being the most superficial to deep where we reach the the point of interaction with the periosteum of the bone is going to be scalp. So as we've mentioned before, the most deep layer is going to be the periosteum of bone. Then connecting directly to the periosteum is going to be a layer of loose connective tissue. And so for the purposes of this drawing, I'm only going to be filling in the layers corresponding to one side, so the structures corresponding to the most lateral aspect of this image, because I want to save the medial aspect for a bit of discussion regarding the common locations of collections. Immediately superficial to this, we have a layer that is referred to as a fibrous aponeurosis. So specifically, the structure is named as the glial aponeurosis, and this is going to be donated in pink. C in our mnemonic is then going to represent a layer of fatty connective tissue, so specifically in the form of adipose tissue. And then lastly, as represented in white, most superficially we have the skin. So this structural arrangement then helps us to understand that when we're looking at a T1 weighted MRI, the reason why we're going to see the, the bright white high intensity layering around the cranium or around the skull is going to be due to the presence of fat 
be a connective tissue. So if we then move on to the intracranial aspects, so specifically we're going to now be talking about the cerebral meningeal layers. There are three main layers that make up the meninges. So if we're starting from superficial to deep, so on the outermost surface of the cranium in direct contact with the bone is going to be our dura mater. So the dura mater, as the name implies, is going to be the most durable. This is going to be the most strongest of the three meninges, and it is actually going to be a bilateral structure in the sense that it has two layers that constitute this. So drawing this on then, we know that the periosteal layer of the dura mater is going to be in direct contact with the bone, and then we also have a visceral layer of dura mater. So in a normal healthy individual, these two layers are going to be intact and continuous with each other, so you don't expect to see an interface or a gap between the two. Collectively, the two dural layers form the dural space. So the dural space is a potential space and it contains important venous structures, including the superior sagittal sinus. Also, as you will recall from your basic anatomy, we know that associated with the dural layers, we have what's known as dural folds. The second meningeal layer then is what's termed the arachnoid mater. So the arachnoid mater is going to be deep to the dura mater, but it's also going to be continuous, so lining like glad wrap to the visceral layer of the dura mater. Notice that the, the arachnoid mater, as the name implies, if you think of a spider or a spider's web, is going to be an entanglement of, of structures or of fibers that are going to enclose the cerebral cortex. So I'll colour in a real space that exists just deep to the arachnoid mater that is referred to as the subarachnoid space. But first I want to just draw in the most deep meningeal layer, which is going to be the pia mater. So the pia mater attaches directly to the brain parenchyma. As evident in green, we can see that within the subarachnoid space, we have cerebral spinal fluid that is circulating within and around the brain. Lastly, what we should also probably cover is the fact that venous drainage from the brain parenchyma is going to drain directly back into the dural space via small veins that are referred to as your dural veins. Another term for these veins are going to be bridging veins because as we can see, they're actually bridging across those meningeal layers. This is an important concept when we start talking about abnormalities in the case of hemorrhages. Just revising what we've done so far. So we have drawn the layers of the scalp from superficial to deep in a normal healthy individual. So firstly, we have the skin followed by the adipose tissue, connective tissue layer. We then have the glial aponeurosis, which is going to be in pink, which is directly attaching to the periosteal layer of the bone. And then working our way in, so now we're within the cranial cavity, we have the endosteal layer of bone is in direct relations with the periosteal layer of the dura mater. The dura mater is going to be made up of two parallel meningeal layers, which is going to be your visceral layer and your periosteal layer. Immediately deep and attaching to the visceral layer of the dura mater, we have the arachnoid mater. We have the CSF flowing in the subarachnoid space just deep to this. And then we have the pia mater that is going to be in direct contact with the brain parenchyma. So now what I wanna cover is just some select pathology in the case of hemorrhaging or collections of blood and in between which layers these are frequently going to occur. Starting with the most common extracranial hemorrhage is going to be a subglial hematoma. So a subglial hematoma, as the name implies, is going to be deep to the glial aponeurosis.
A subglial hematoma is relatively common when we're looking at cases of trauma to the skull and usually in the case of an acute bleed will appear as a hyperdense region just external to the side of fracture on a CT scan and we can also see in terms of patient presentation the patient will usually present with a bump or a swelling to the head that's usually associated with bruising. If we then move on to talk about traumatic brain injury there are three common types of collections that we find depending on the location and the mechanism of trauma. So firstly, when we see blood that's going to be located just deep to the skull, so between the endosteum as well as the periosteal layer of the dura mater, this is referred to as an epidural hemorrhage. Just to clarify on this diagram, we can then see that the presence of an epidural collection or hemorrhage just deep to the endosteal layer of the scalp is going to result in displacement then of both layers of the dura mater. This type of hemorrhage is going to be the least common. It is most commonly seen in cases of trauma, but it's classically going to present as a lemon-like or convexity um, on a CT scan due to the fact that it is going to be limited by the sutures of the skull. The second type of hemorrhage, which is also going to be the second most common type, is going to be a subdural hemorrhage. So the subdural hemorrhage is going to be located between the visceral layer of the dura mater and the arachnoid mater. A subdural hemorrhage is going to be consistent and coursing with the, the subdural space in the sense that it's usually going to present as a fairly crescenteric or long bleed and you should see it completely in the antero-posterior direction of the skull without being confined to the sutures. Also, it's important to know that due to the relationship of the arachnoid mater with the visceral layer of the dura mater, typically you will also see blood extending into the dural folds, such as the folk cerebri or the tentorium cerebelli. Then lastly, our most common type of hemorrhage is going to be a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So there are two main causes for a subarachnoid hemorrhage. The first is going to be trauma, where you expect to see blood located within the major sulci of the brain. The second is going to be due to a hemorrhage in the case of a berry aneurysm bursting and then blood flowing within the subarachnoid space, the cisterns and the ventricular system. A subarachnoid hemorrhage as the name implies, is going to be confined to the subarachnoid space. So this is why you will see it extending around the brain within the sulci and then also back up into the ventricular system and then pulling within the cisterns. So then just recapping the layers or the spaces in which the three most common types of intracranial hemorrhages are going to be located is firstly an epidural is between the skull and the first layer or the periosteal layer of the dura mater. A subdural hemorrhage is located between the visceral layer of the dura and the arachnoid mater. And then the most frequent type, so a subarachnoid hemorrhage is located within the real space, which is going to be the subarachnoid space. Lastly, I just wanna clarify the difference between intracranial versus intraaxial. Intracranial is referring to within the cranial cavity. Intraaxial is going to be within the brain tissue. So an intraaxial bleed is typically going to be located within the brain parenchyma, so deep or involving the pia mater. An extra axial hemorrhage or collection is then going to be external to the brain but still within the cranial cavity and this is going to correspond to structures like the subarachnoid space, your arachnoid and your dura mater. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you found this informative.